We got it pulled up. There we go. Too far. There we go. Um, so this morning we're going to move past our introduction. Mom, there we go. Uh, we're going to move past our introduction that we have spent three weeks on. And we're going to start looking at, you know, kind of the whole idea that I want to go with in this whole study, which is, you know, what is our defense? And I base all this on 1 Peter 3.15, where he says, But sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. We can't argue our point. We can't try to profess greatness or knowledge over anyone else. Everyone has their own viewpoints, and they come from what they're raised in. They come from what they're exposed to. You know, as far as I know, every one of us in here were born in America. For the most part, we were born in the South. Most of us were born in this part of North Alabama. This is what we're used to. You know, I want you to think, how many of you have sat down and read um, the Quran? How many of you have extensively studied um, doctrines of Buddhism or Hinduism? I haven't. I've had enough history classes that I've been exposed to them, and I've seen a few enough things that kind of point error out in them that I don't necessarily agree with. But how many of us have sat down and evaluated other belief systems outside of our own? I haven't. I just have not. I haven't had time. There's not enough hours in the day for me to find what I believe and find out what other people believe, but I've tried to do the best that I can. We only can find what we're exposed to. And if you're not exposed to Christianity, you're not going to understand it with the depth and the knowledge that we have of it. So this is the way that I would describe faith. Faith is only sufficient to the point that you will trust your immortal soul with it. You know, when you hop in the car and you go to drive across O'Neill Bridge, you trust that it's going to stay there and get you across the bridge. It's going to get you across the river. If you didn't, I think you'd try another way to get across the Tennessee River. But we're not talking about our physical body. We're not talking about our safety. We're not talking about... You know, something that we've seen time and time again sustain us. We're putting our hope and our faith in an idea that's more than our body, more than our, you know, life. It's our soul and it's eternity. And it can't be taken lightly. We can't just say, well, I always grew up with it. It's what I think it is. You know, I just, I just feel that this is right. I just believe it. I, I, you know, I, I, it, it can't be that because that's what everyone else in the world does too. And if we claim to be something different, then we've got to have more substance to our faith. It's not just the blind following of something because it's what we've always done. And I know that's what I did for the first large portion of my life. It's what I grew up in. It's what, you know, everybody, I've always heard it's right, but I didn't realize I was in an echo chamber. I didn't realize that I was surrounded by Christians I was surrounding myself in the church. I was surrounded by a part of the world that is predominantly believers in God, whether they follow the Bible as we do or not. Everyone, you know, pretty much around here, everyone believes that there's a God. They believe it's the God of the New Testament. They believe that Jesus came to earth and died. And, you know, when you surround yourself with the same things, you're not challenged to grow. You're not challenged to evaluate what you believe. And it would be very easy for me to make these lessons, to go cherry-pick verses, to go cherry-pick historians, to go cherry-pick things that agree with what I say. It would be very easy to sit back and to listen to all that and think, well, it all agrees with me. I'm good. But then we would fall into the self-serving bias and we would fall into the other biases that we talked about last week. And I don't want us to do that. I want us to challenge ourselves. As I said last week, this is meat. This is not, you know, the beginnings of the Word. You know, if you're a new believer hearing this or if you're a skeptic and you don't believe in Christ yet, you know, hopefully this is something that will get you thinking. You may not be ready for the material that we're going to cover today. That's okay. This is to get you to start thinking about some questions that you don't have answers to so you can find stronger members in the church to discuss them with. And for those of us who are grounded in our faith, who understand what we believe, this is to help validate it. This is to help strengthen it. This is to help show... You know, there's some credibility to this. Because the biggest thing that I see in the world today is they want to use that black and white fallacy. 
they want to draw this as there's two sides. There's science, which is the smart people, and there's faith, which is the dumb people who blindly follow the teachings of a person 2,000 years ago that probably didn't even exist. You know, there's two options in their mind. Don't fall into that. Let's realize there's a lot of depth, complexity, and there is so much more than we can ever know. I mean, the Bible tells us that God's ways are so much greater than ours. We can't know everything. But we must study and we must dig into it the best that we can. So how do you defend your faith? I really haven't had to do it in about 10 or 12 years. The last time that I remember having to defend my faith was on that campus across there, and it wasn't to a professor, because honestly, for the most part, the professors I had were Christian. Whether in geographies, whether in you know, any class I took, for the most part, no one ever challenged me on anything. No one ever questioned me or told the class that God doesn't exist. Or I didn't see any of that. But I did have a classmate who was an atheist. And actually, about 10 years ago, he actually was in a debate. And he was the atheist in the debate. And the scary thing is, he came off looking a lot better than the other guy, than the Christian in the debate, because he was able to win the crowd over with, you know, his mannerisms and the way he carried himself. And it made me really uncomfortable to realize that so much of something that we believe is true can be lost if we don't present it in the right way. If we come across as arrogant, if we come across as um, pushy, it's not going to resonate with people because in that, in that single moment, I saw someone who had the right facts, who had the right information, you know, lose the crowd to someone who just asked the right questions and did it with a smile on his face. And it's scary when you realize that it doesn't matter if you have all the answers if you can't present it in the right way. And that's what we have to do. We have to follow the last part of 1 Peter 3.15, where we do it in gentleness and reverence. So, we're not going to go into science today. Instead, we're going to look at the way that I think that best defends my faith. And I hope it will you know, help you too. Because it's not science, because as we've already discussed, there's so much inference when you start looking in science. We have you know, what we can observe now, and everything else we have is what we've had to infer from other people. But there is one way that we can get an idea of the validity of the Bible without looking at science or without just blindly trusting, and that's to look at the history. So today's going to be a history lesson. It's what my degree's in, and I haven't got to teach it in about eight years, so I'm excited. Um, so we're going to look at four different ways that we have historical evidence and four different things that, to me, validate my faith as a Christian. So the first, we're going to look at some history. We're going to talk about some history. I want you to think of any three people that are non-biblical that you can name prior to about 200 AD. The list is probably pretty short. In fact, it's probably just these three guys right here. Maybe a few others, but probably not many more. So the first one on the left is Julius Caesar. The middle one is Alexander the Great, and the one on the right is um, Socrates. So Julius Caesar. How many ways do we know about Julius Caesar? How many historical references, citations, places can we find information about this great Roman emperor? Cicero, who is a contemporary of him, writes about him. Plutarch writes about him. Suetonius writes about him a couple hundred years afterwards. And then there's about three more sources that are a few hundred years later. We have this sculpture we have, and coinage. We have coins with his name on it. And then we have a lot of writings from Julius Caesar himself. So this was an emperor. He ruled a lot of the known world. And we have a total of about six sources that tell us about him. Going back even further to a couple hundred years uh, BC, we have Alexander the Great. And there were no contemporary artifacts of him. We have historical records that are passed down and they're passed down. 
but nothing from the time period. And then Socrates. Socrates may not have even existed. What we know about him is he was the teacher of Plato, and the thing is, Plato may have made him up to be a dialogue character in his examples and in his stories. He may have been real, he may not, but we don't have any other references or examples of him. And yet these three people are who, you know, no one really questions, except people do question Socrates, but the other two, no one questions their existence. The question then becomes, why do people necessarily challenge Jesus? You know, we're going to look now at the Bible. We're going to look at how it compares, or actually, sorry, we're going to look at um, references to Jesus. So here are some of the historical writings. These are extra biblical. They do not come from the Bible. These are historians, some of which are going to be contrary to what Christianity would say. So the first one is Tacitus. And Tacitus wrote, he was a Roman historian, he wrote in his annals, but all human efforts, all the lavish gifts of the emperor and the, and the propitiations of the gods did not banish the sinister belief that the conflagration was the result of an order. This is talking about the burning of Rome. Consequently, to get rid of the report, Nero fastened the guilt and inflicted the most exquisite tortures on a class hated for their abominations called Christians by the populace. Christus, from whom the name had its origin, suffered the extreme penalty during the reign of Tiberius at the hands of one of, the most, one of our procurators, Pontius Pilate, and a most mischievous superstition, thus checked for the moment, again broke out not only in Judea, the first source of evil, but even in Rome, where all things hideous and shameful from every part of the world find their center and become popular." Accordingly, an arrest was first made of all, the plead, of all who pleaded guilty, then upon their information an immense multitude was convicted, not so much of the crime of firing the city as of hatred against mankind. What things stand out from Tacitus here that we know from the Bible that we can see a correlation or an agreement? There's a couple things here that when we read this, we recognize them already as things that we see in the Bible or we know from our Bible study that, you know, these are things that we agree with. What do we see? Pontius Pilate. What else? Christ suffered on the cross. There was a fire in Rome. And who was blamed for it? The Christians. And Tacitus says here, they didn't really start the fire. What, what was it that got the Christians to suffer this punishment? It's something that scares me because it's what I'm afraid our future looks like in the next few years as a hatred against mankind. This statement scares me because what I see here is people who would not immediately go along with what everyone else was saying and doing and judge them for it accordingly, I mean rightly. And how are we going to look to the world in the coming decades as everything is condoned and everything is accepted and we refuse to accept it. I'm afraid we see ourselves heading toward a world that looks something like the first century. I hope it doesn't get that bad, but it's something to be aware of. Anything else in this writing from Tacitus that we can see? Well, they all pleaded guilty to Christians. Pleaded guilty, yeah, they didn't, they didn't turn their backs on it. They, they stood up for what they believed. All right, the next one is Lucian, and he was a Greek historian. And he wrote, The Christians, you know, worshipped a man to this day, the distinguished personage who introduced their novel rites and was crucified on that account. You see, these misguided creatures start with a general conviction that they are immortal for all time, which explains the contempt of death and voluntary self-devotion self which are so common among them. And then it was impressed on them by their original lawgiver, that they all brothers from the moment that they were converted and deny the gods of Greece and worship the crucified sage and live after his laws. All this they take quite on faith with the result that they despise all worldly goods alike regarding them merely as common property. Does he speak very favorably of these Christians? To call them, where was it, misguided creatures? I don't think that he's in favor of them. 
I don't think he agrees with their beliefs. But what we read here, does this sound accurate to what we saw in the first century? Does it sound accurate to what we strive to be today? I mean, we live after Jesus' laws. We take it on faith. Hopefully it's not a misguided faith. And we hope that we, you know, condemn the things of this world knowing that there's more waiting for us in heaven. Go ahead, Randy. I agree with that. I think that that's definitely what they're saying there. And I'm not sure where Lucian says he's a Greek historian. I'm not sure where he lived. I'm not sure where he traveled to. I'm not sure what Christians he encountered, if they were in Jerusalem or if they were somewhere in Greece or Turkey. Um, I'm not sure. But, you know, this is, this religion of the first century was throughout the Mediterranean world. I mean, Paul traveled all around. Paul wrote letters. We have these epistles that were written. We can see that this was not confined to just Jerusalem. We can see this is not confined just to Rome. So it's also interesting that the teachings that we see here match up with what we read in other extra-biblical accounts, that this is something that was fairly unified. And, of course, we have the epistles which were written to teach the errors that some areas and some cities were practicing. But it shows that for the most part they were on the same page. Anything else? Yes? We do see that that's the way the world views us. Mm -hmm. It's obvious. I mean, and it's way back then. They viewed us the same way as people were on the is... And the Bible teaches us to be sanctified and set apart. And we're odd, we're strange, we don't. Well, and, and when you. Do whatever else does. And when you look at it from the world's perspective, here we take four hours, four hours of our week to come sit in the building and talk about somebody who may have lived 2,000 years ago when we could be out on the river, we could out, be out having fun. You know, because in most people's minds, that's what life is. You enjoy your life as much as you can because that's all you got. And if that's how they view their world, that is strange that we would come put on our better clothes, come sit in the building, sit quietly, listen to someone talk about something that happened in ancient times. That does sound strange when you put it in that perspective. And yet, people that don't realize that and they live their lives looking for happiness, they live their lives chasing the next excitement, don't realize the joy that's associated with this life. And hopefully that's what I want one of my lessons to be about toward the end, is just how this is the best life you can live regardless of outcome afterwards. Um, so the next one I have is Pliny or Pliny. I, I call, I've always heard Pliny uh, the Younger. And he was actually a Roman governor in Turkey, in Bithynia. So they, the Christians, were in the habit of meeting on a certain fixed day before it was light when they sang in alternate verses a hymn to Christ as to a God and bound themselves to a solemn oath not to do any wicked deeds, but never to commit any fraud, theft, or adultery, never to falsify their word, nor deny a trust when they should be called upon to deliver upon it, after which was their custom to separate and then reassemble to partake of food, but food of an ordinary and in, partake of food, but food of any of an ordinary and innocent kind. So here's a Roman governor writing back to Rome a report about this group of people. And again, we see things that match very closely to what we do today. Now, we're not getting up before daylight, but we're here, we're assembled, and the things that they are doing are the things that we're striving to do also, to not live after the world. We're here you know, to not commit fraud, theft, or adultery, not to falsify our word. And we assemble to partake of food, the Lord's Supper. And also, we read in the first century where the church gathered together and they shared food with each other. They ate together beyond the Lord's Supper. They had fellowship with each other. And to me, these examples just go to show how much information there is outside the Bible. 
So next is the Jewish Talmud. These are rabbinical teachings from about 1 or 200 A.D. And so, of course, you know, if these are Jewish rabbis that are writing this, they're not going to think too kindly of a breakaway religion that was based on their beliefs. And they said, on the eve of the Passover, Yeshu was hanged, which would be just the Jewish spelling or the Hebrew spelling for Jesus. For 40 days before uh, the execution took place, a herald went forth and cried, He is going forth to be stoned because he has practiced sorcery and enticed Israel to apostasy. Anyone who can say anything in his favor, let him come forward and plead on his behalf. But since nothing was ever brought forward in his favor, he was hanged on the eve of the Passover. And we know that Jesus was crucified right before the Passover. And so this is, here's something that's written a hundred, maybe a hundred years later, that shows even in the Jewish world, even in uh, rabbi's teachings, they, they, they acknowledge that Jesus was hanged on a tree, you know, crucified, and it was right before the Passover. And of course, this isn't the perspective that they would have. What is important to them? The Passover and, you know, the practices of Judaism. In the Greek and the Roman, we don't see them with this perspective. They're looking at a different perspective. And so next, this is Celsus. And Celsus was a Greek philosopher and he was an early opponent of Christianity. And so in his first uh, writing, Jesus kept all the Jewish customs. And then, Jesus had come from a village in Judea where he was the son of a poor Jewess who gained her living by the works of her own hands. His mother had been turned out of doors by her husband, who was a carpenter by trade, on being convicted of adultery. Being thus driven away by her husband and wandering about in disgrace, she gave birth to Jesus. Jesus, on account of his poverty, was hired out to go to Egypt. While there, he acquired certain magical powers which Egyptians pride themselves on possessing. He returned home, highly elated at possessing these powers, and on the strength of them gave himself out to be a god. And then, if Christ had been thrown down a cliff or pushed into a pit or strangled with a rope, then they, meaning Christians, would speak of a cliff of life or a pit of resurrection or a rope of immortality. Of course, all the facts don't jive with what we see in the Bible because these are not inspired writings. But this is very, very close to what we see in the biblical accounts. We know that Mary, you know, conceived without, you know, a man. We know that Jesus was the Son of God. We see that, you know, his Joseph was a carpenter. We see that she gave birth and people didn't really think it was in the best taste. We see that they went down to Egypt. We see that Jesus came back and in this account, he possessed magical powers given by the Egyptians, but we know that he actually possessed powers because he's the Son of God. And even here it says that he believed that he was a God. It's amazing to see these writings that are attacking the church, but also line up completely with it. Very often in the world today, people want to say that Christians have a blind faith, say that Christians have no extra-biblical accounts to, to agree, but that's just wrong. We have, you know, all of these sources, most of which are contrary to what the Bible would say, and attacking Christians, but still agree in principle and in historical account with what we find in the Bible. The last one I want to talk about is Josephus, and Josephus is a little bit different because... Josephus was a Jewish historian, and he lived about the time of the destruction of the, of the Roman wars, and midway through it, he realized that the Jews were going to lose, and he actually defected to the Roman side and became a Roman historian. But he was a Jew, and this is where some of the questions with this authenticity come up, and this is why I put it for last. I'll read the quotes, then I'll discuss afterwards. Um, and so first, in his Antiquities, he says, Now some of the Jews thought that the destruction of Herod's army came from God, and that very justly, as a punishment of what he did against John, that was called the Baptist, for Herod slew him, who was a good man, and commanded the Jews to ex exercise virtue, 
both as to righteousness towards one another and piety towards God, and so to come to baptism, for that the washing with water would be acceptable of him, or acceptable to him. If they made use of it, not in order to the putting away or the remission of some sins only, but for the purification of the body, supposing still that the soul was thoroughly purified before beforehand by righteousness. So there is mention of John the Baptist as a historical figure. Next. Um, now there was about this time Jesus, a wise man, if it be lawful to call him a man, for he was a doer of wonderful works, a teacher of such men as receiveth the truth with pleasure. He drew over to him both many of the Jews and many of the Gentiles. He was the Christ. And when Pilate, at the suggestion of the principal men again amongst us, had condemned him to the cross, those that loved him at first did not forsake him, for he appeared to them alive again on the third day, as the divine prophets had foretold, these and then ten thousand other wonderful things concerning him. And the tribe, and the tribe of Christians so named from him are not extinct to this day. Now, the issue with this is if you have a Jew here who is writing a history and never converted to Christianity himself, why would he say all these glowing remarks about Jesus? And the answer that anyone in the secular world is going to give you is, well, that's easy. He didn't write them. There are parts and there are manuscripts that they can find edits to. It's a lot of them. A lot of them are in agreement. And the oldest ones contain bits and pieces mentioning Jesus as a historical figure, but do not have the comments of calling him the Christ or about resurrecting on the third day. So, take it for what you want. A lot of historians will say, yeah, these are legit. He did write them. And a lot more will say, no, these were forgeries. They were edited after the fact to include a lot of positive remarks. Either way, the oldest writings still contain mention of Jesus. They just don't have as many glowing remarks about him. Um, also, he writes, Festus was now dead, and Albinius was, a, was, uh, Albinius was but upon the road. So, so he assembled the Sanhedrin of judges and brought before them the brother of Jesus, who was called the Christ, whose name was James, and some others, or some of his companions. And when he formed an accusation against them as the breakers of the law, he delivered them to be stoned. But as for those who seemed to be most equitable of the citizens, and such as were the most uneasy at the breach of the laws, they disliked, they disliked what was done. So here's another mention later on in Josephus' writing of Jesus. So even when you take out the questionable parts that people want to say, eh, that's not, that's not accurate to his writing, we still have multiple references in Josephus about Jesus. Um, so any more thoughts on any of these quotes? <coughs> Yes. From history, it seems that the portrayal of Jesus was a decent, although misguided man. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, from a bigger perspective outside of where we live in the world, is that the general complaint today of Jesus from non believers? I have an idea that. Nothing is as concrete as it appears on any level. And I think back to the fall of the Soviet Union for this. The Soviet Union appeared to be such a solid block. And yet, when one or two people started to say, maybe this communism isn't as great an idea as we thought, it flipped on its head in such a hurry. It's very easy in our world to profess one thing and believe another because we were more concerned with what we look like on the outside. What is the quote? There are no atheists in the foxholes. I sometimes think that some of the most staunch believers have more doubts than they would ever let on, and vice versa. I don't think anything's as easy as it appears. So when you ask, you know, is this the general belief? I don't think there's any way of knowing man's hearts. I think that a lot of the world would want you to believe no one believes this except those crazy Christians. But as we'll discuss in lessons coming up, when you look at our universe around us, it's very difficult to think it just happened. And the Bible corroborates that, the Bible states that, but even outside of the Bible, because it's, it's impossible to convince a non-believer 
to become a Christian just using the Bible. If they don't believe it, they're not going to listen to it. And that's what the value of this lesson is. Hopefully, so far I've shown, you know, these are extra biblical. These are people who were not in agreement with what the Bible said. They did not believe that Jesus was the Son of God, and yet they still mention it. So I'm going to quickly move through the rest of this. So, the Bible. When we look at these four historical documents, now we believe the Iliad was, you know, prose. It was a poem by Homer, and Homer may not have even been real either. But it has 643 manuscripts that we know of. The histories of Herodotus, which we take as history, has eight manuscripts. The Jewish Wars by Josephus has nine, and the histories of Tacitus have two. And as you can see, uh, the earliest manuscripts are almost 1,400 years late for Herodotus, 330 for Josephus, and 800 years later for Tacitus. We don't have the original documents. We have transcriptions of them from many, many hundreds of years later. But the Bible, there are 5,726 5, manuscripts that we have. And the earliest ones range that we still have are 25 to 75 years after the uh, writing. But they don't want to accept the Bible as history. And I realize, and if and an atheist were to walk in here who has studied this much more than I have, they would immediately begin to tear those numbers apart because, well, some of those are hundreds of years later. Some of those we know were forgeries. Yes. And as we discussed in our first lesson, all we have is observation and inference. They've done their study. Other people have done their study. And we bring our natural biases. And what we're left with is what we believe. Their, their belief is not superior to ours. We must respect theirs also because we're not going to convince anybody by just saying, I'm right, look at the data. So the New Testament is the most authenticated collection of documents based on historical documentation. It has more historical validity than any other ancient volume. And we don't question the others. We write them down as, down as history books. So here are some other writers that sprang up in the church afterwards. So these are not extra biblical in the sense that they were not Christians. All the others were not really Christians that wrote those things. These are Christian writers that sprang up in the uh, few years after. So Clement of Rome, Ignatius, Polycarp, Justin Martyr, within you know, 150 years of the founding of the church, here are four writers that we have many, many, many volumes. And it's even said, and Irenaeus also, and it's even said by Bruce Metzger, who's a Bible scholar, indeed so extensive are these citations that if all other sources for our knowledge of the text of the New Testament were destroyed, they would be sufficient alone in reconstructing practically the entire New Testament. So even if you destroyed every original manuscript of the Bible, you could take the quotes from these writers and reconstruct practically the whole New Testament. That is how much information we have to validate the existence of the biblical accounts. So when you look at geographical, sociological, political data, the Bible is accurate in all of those. When it talks from going, from going down from Jericho to Jerusalem, or vice versa, I can't remember off the top of my head which direction it said. Maybe it's not north-south, but when you look at geographically with sea level, you are descending. So even the things that sometimes appear to be inaccurate, we find that that's how they would have referenced them in that time period. So, quickly, because I have two minutes, um, and I'll probably stop here. There are arguments against this. And as I said, it would have been very easy for me to go ahead, watch a few YouTube videos, agreeing with what I want to say, and leaving it at that. But I feel like that would be doing injustice to this study. So I also watched a few atheistic points about why there was probably no Jesus. And if there was, he was a good man who taught some things and he led a lot of people astray. So some of the arguments are, of course, the forgeries of historical documents. They want to say that there are certain books in our Bible that don't even... They, we know they were forgeries. Two times this author that I was uh, watching said, and we know Second Peter was written just to validate First Peter. No, it was a forgery from a few decades later. And he pointed out a couple books in our Bible that he says, you know, we know those aren't real. Um, interpolations of Scripture. So sometimes how we will, you know, say this is what it means, but really it meant something else. And he says that we've... Mis we've skewed some things and misrepresented some things. One of his examples is that most of Christianity had died out by about 100 A.D. And his reasoning was, is people's lifespans are about half of what they are today. 
So information is lost at a much quicker rate. So within two generations, Christianity had died out, and that's why they had to write all of this down very quickly to build the religion back up again. Um, then it references many other examples where Jesus is actually a knockoff of other religious beliefs and that the ideas from Judaism were borrowed from other ideas of blood magic and different ancient mystery religions. So there are a lot of ways that people are going to attack Christianity, and maybe we can get into some of them next week. All right, thank you.